In times of sickness and plagues and crisis, when there's global fear like it's going on in the world right now, one of the questions I think that arises is, God, don't you care? God, where are you? Can't you see? Can't you hear? I mean, aren't you all powerful and, and mighty? And, and I want to draw your attention. I want to spend some time today in a psalm, and it's Psalm 8. And I think it, well, it, it helps answer some of these questions. Listen to the psalm, O Lord, O Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength. Because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Now, most scholars and Bible commentators believe that this psalm was written by David in some of his younger years. The early part of David's call, the early part of David's life when he was still a young shepherd out on the hillside. And he had a lot of time. He, he had uh, the ability and the freedom to, well, to be there on the hillside of Judea and to look up into the stars at night. There's, there's no, you know, lights back then, no Walmarts or Sam's Clubs. There's no smog. And he, he could look up into the heavens and see the amazing view that you have when you can see stars that way. And he could be overwhelmed by the galaxies and the majesty of it. So he pins his thoughts. And he says, God, you're majestic, you're excellent, you're, you're glorious. I mean, I think we've all had those times in nature when we, we are out at the beach or surfing or on a mountain or some beautiful place. And we, we kind of look around and go, man, God, how... How amazing, how majestic and creative you are. In fact, in verse 2, I read it, he, he says, Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength, because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. He, he kind of is saying this, God, you're so majestic, you're, you're so amazing and powerful, even a child can see it. Even a child can express their heart and can see how great and understand how amazing you are. It's not hard for a child even to, to look up into the sky and, and know this was not done by man or it's not some accident, some freak of nature. The simple recognize the hand of God. I mean, this is what happens in that story when Jesus comes into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Uh, we see the story in Matthew uh, chapter 21. All the crowd is there and the people are gathered. They're waiting for Jesus and it says, when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Y yes, he replied, Jesus replying. Have you never read? And he quotes this psalm, Psalm 8. From the lips of children and infants, Lord, you have called forth your praise. And the word children there, it's not little children doing it, but it's, just, it's these scribes, these Pharisees, these religious people who kind of look at the, the common people, if you will, as children, as being very simple, sort of street people, sort of ignorant. And they're offended. They're upset. And Jesus quotes this psalm. It's like when the Apostle Paul in Corinthians says, God has chosen the weak and the foolish things of this earth. It's the proud who don't see it. It's those who are so wise and so self-sufficient. They can't get it. They, they can't perceive it. But through the simplicity of childlike faith, he says, Lord, you silence your enemies. The story's told about a professor in a very uh, distinguished university. He was lecturing his students and he would always, because, well, he was an atheist, 
He would always say in every one of his lectures, there is no God. There is no God. And in the back of one of his classes, there was a simple man who was a dishwasher in a local restaurant. And he was taking a course in the university. And he would listen to this over and over, this professor saying, there is no God. And the dishwasher knew. He knew God himself personally, and he loved God. And so one day, he, he raised his hand up high, and finally a professor recognized him in the back of the room, and he stood up and said, Sir, the next time you say there is no God, would you please add this to it? As far as I know. As far as I know, there's no God. See, because no one can prove there is no God. We don't and can't say there is no God because our understanding well, it's, it's extremely limited. Some try to explain away God, or even some try to explain away the miracles of Jesus. I, I love the story of the little boy who's, who's in a Sunday school class. He's at a very liberal church, and they're talking about the miracles of Jesus and the feeding of the 5,000. And this teacher said, well, it, it looks like a miracle, but, but really... What happened was when the little boy, you know, took out his lunch from underneath his robe and began to share, it kind of, well, it, it, it convicted everyone else. And so they took out their lunches and they all had a meal. The little boy listened to that and he'd never heard that before. And he, he thought to himself and finally he asked the question, well, then where did the 12 baskets come Afterwards, it were all so full, and the teacher really didn't have an answer. It just said, well, let's move on. God says in Scripture to, to come to me with humility, with expectation, with wonder, with faith. In fact, Jesus, his own word said, except you become as a little child, you can enter the kingdom of God. Now, Think about David for a minute. As a youth, out there on the fields of Bethlehem outside Judea, he looks up and he says, Lord, as I, as I look into the heavens, and, and even the mouth of babes, the young children would know this, that you have created all things, you're majestic, and you have given strength. Anyone can see how great you are. Listen to what he says as he goes on. He says, when I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers and the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? God, when I, when I look up on a starry night at the heavens, David says, it, it's It's powerful. There's no storm or virus or flood or tornado or anything that can destroy you or all that you've created. I, I see order, I see beauty, I see vastness of the universe. And, and even today, you know, with our ability in so-called modern technology, we have the ability to travel in space, to, to measure distance with the speed of light, to, to send out satellites and space stations and probes and to, to travel through space. Even some 31 centuries later, as you walk out on a dark night and you or I look up into the stars and the galaxies and planets, we're still amazed at it, at the symmetry and the orbits and the vastness of it all. And it's still easy to say, God, it's incredible. It's phenomenal. And to ask the question that David asks here, what is man? What, who am I, Lord, in the midst of all of this that you would consider us? I mean, that's a question that's been asked, I think, since the beginning of time. God, what is man? What is he? Where, where did he come from? Why are we on this planet? What's the purpose of our existence and after all the questioning for centuries really it boils down to two answers one man's just another creature here on earth like all the other animals that are existing he may have a higher intelligence and that's 
That can be questioned, obviously. He has rationality, the ability to think ahead and to remember. But many believe just still a part of the great cosmic machine that exists here in space and that we're all equal. And if he or she is lucky, fortunate, blessed, maybe you'll be born in a place where you can have, you know, a roof over your head and food and water and safety and live happily ever after, so to speak. But no real meaning, no purpose. You live, you die. Shakespeare said it like this. He said, life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. It's that philosophy of eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you will die. Or I think the modern vernacular is something like this. The one who dies with the most toys wins. And boy, that, that's kind of our culture's mindset, it seems like. The other option is there is a God. And David continues his psalm like this. After he looks up and after he says, even a child and God, what, what am I that you should, you know, even consider me? He says, for you have made him, speaking of mankind, you have made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. God, you've given him purpose. Being made by you, you've given him power and authority and creativity. Man is unique because of you, God, and, and he's like you. He's made in your image and he can know you and he can serve you. And in fact, we know this, well, because we've experienced it, if you're a believer, and because the New Testament tells us. And God does take up residence within us. My spirit bears witness with his spirit. In fact, he lives in you and I. That's what the scripture says. You're, you're his temple. You, you bear his image, a, a unique vessel that God has created, one to carry forth his will and to Speak forth his message. See, God, like a, like a potter, shapes and fashions each of us, like a vessel for his honor. And he pours himself into your life. And he creates you with certain gifts and characters and passion and life and love and gives us all kinds of different callings in life. You might be a school teacher, or you might be an artist, or a musician, or a builder, or a mom, or a dad, whatever it might be. God has made you that. And I would submit to you that we're to do it as unto him, and for him, and with him. David, as he's looking in the heavens, as he's thinking about who is man, and how God even reaches and speaks through the simple he tells us in verse 6 through 8, you have made him to have, speaking of mankind, dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea, all put under his feet. And that sounds great. It sounds amazing. God, you've, you've, you've given mankind dominion. But you stop there and you say, well, it sounds great, but... What about sharks? We don't seem to have much dominion over them. What about snakes and viruses and tornadoes? Not sure it's working out like Psalm 8 says. Now, I want you to listen to and look at a passage with me that helps us see the full story of man's dominion. It's found in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2. And listen to what it says because he he quotes this very verse in the New Testament and answers this whole dominion thing. In Hebrews chapter 2, beginning with verse 5, For he has not put the world to come, of which we speak in subjection to angels, but one testified in a certain place, and that one is David in Psalm 8. What is man that you're mindful of him? Are the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor and you set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection 
under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not under him. But now we do not yet see all the things put under him. We don't see it yet, even though it's there. It's not quite completed is what he's saying. And then he adds this verse. Now listen, tune in. But we do see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Not quite under our feet yet, everything. But he says we do see Jesus. We know in a fallen world where man has sinned, where man is guilty, that God has a plan, he has a purpose, and he sent his son with a unique love for each of us. We don't see all things under our feet because right now there's sickness and there's death and there's chaos, there's hurt. But the writer of Hebrews adds this, we do see Jesus. We get a glimpse of what is to come. All things will be subjected. We see what Jesus has done and one day what he will do. I mean, if you look through the Gospels at the life of Jesus, you see how life will be lived one day. Jesus comes to a wedding. They, they run out of wine. It's humiliating to the family. It would be a major cultural faux pas. And Jesus brings great joy and great remedy to the situation. We see Jesus say to a storm that's about to destroy the disciples, they're in fear. He says, peace be still. Those things aren't under our feet right now, but they were his. We see Jesus at a place where he multiplies loaves and fishes and feeds everyone to their completely full. We see Jesus healing lepers. We don't have dominion over all, but we do see Jesus. We get, we get a glimpse of what's to come. And it's amazing. It's powerful. And one day, he will come. One day, we will see Jesus, our hope, our Savior, and our King. I, I want to read one more passage of Scripture. We're almost finished from Romans chapter 8. Listen to what it says, beginning in verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God, of when things will be under our subjection. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. So we wait, but we get a glimpse. We see Jesus. We know he's real. Like David, who knows God is real, he, he looks up into the heavens and he says, Oh Lord, oh Lord, how excellent you are. And God draws close to us through Christ. And he comes in difficult times. It says we groan. And we, we groan more for him to come as the end gets near. God has a plan. He is the creator. And one thing he creates, listen, as we enter into times that are difficult and as I believe we see the coming of the Lord coming closer and closer, he creates in us a deeper thirst for that which is to come. In fact, the last verse there in Psalm 8, verse 9, it says, O Lord, he, he says it again, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. God, you speak. You not only speak to the simple and the weak, but you speak through the simple and the weak. God, you're invested in us, and God does love you. And God is preparing the world in some way through this virus, I believe. He has a plan for all things, and he works all things together for the good. God, 
What are we, David says to you? Well, what is it that man is that makes him so meaningful to you and you're mindful of him? That even through difficult times, politically or economically or emotionally, that Lord, you give us a glimpse of what's to come. And the world is shaken right now. And David, in the midst of his time, he, he looks up to heaven and he recognizes God. How, how excellent is your name? He says, oh Lord, oh Lord. Yet, as God looks at us in this situation, he gives us a glimpse of what's to come through his son, Jesus Christ, whom he sent to die for you and I. And one day he will make all things new. And I, I believe it's soon. This, this pandemic that we're walking through, going through, reveals the, the whole way everything could come together and make this one kind of one world power through gro globalism, through economy, through, through medicine, through political ways. And it causes us to see in a greater way, I think, that Jesus, well, he's our hope. He's our coming king. And if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, I believe he's coming soon. And you should prepare, you should get your heart ready for his coming. And you can do that by asking him to be your Lord and your Savior and receiving him in your heart. And they'll share some ways for you to do that if you contact us online. So right now, listen, we close our message by saying this, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth who have set your glory above the heavens. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for what's going on in our world right now. And thank you for the glimpse that we get of what's to come as we see Jesus and wait for him. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. <laughs>